Hi, I is live. It's seven o'clock. Uh, we are in the midst of the coronavirus lockdown. We're going to look back at these videos in years to come. Obviously, this, this is going to be in a time capsule. Of this like weird coronavirus lockdown time. We've got some questions. Of course, we've got some questions. But if you do have a question, then please feel free to uh, uh, oh, that. Ask, ask me. I will do my level best to answer it. This is a question from last week, and I'm really sorry. I forgot to make, I forgot, I forgot. Full disclosure, I forgot. What is this fat graph? And I think I can't, I got a, f anyway, I'll just talk in general terms of uh, fat graph. I think it was about buttock in particular, but, I've spoken before about fat graft to the button. We're not supposed to be doing it because it's got a high complication rate. So, um, but just in general terms, what is fat graft? Uh, I guess, what is this fat graft? This fat graft is a very effective procedure, which involves taking fat. Basically, you look at fillers. People talk about fillers and you've got, permanent you've got different types of fillers you've got permanent fillers and temporary fillers and temporary fillers are usually things like hyaluronic acid which are the fillers that you would normally associate with fillers when people talk about fillers they normally you, you conjure up visions of a man with a syringe injecting in your nasal labial fold or you know in wrinkles to try and fill out wrinkles and that is a, a a temporary filler. It's hyaluronic acid. It sort of dissolves over um, months and then you might need to have it done again. But you can have permanent fillers and fat is an example of a permanent filler. Fat being your fat. And what we do is we take your fat from one part of your body. It doesn't matter where, just wherever we can get it from. Uh, commonly tummy. Uh, thighs are good as well. Outer thighs are good. Uh, but somewhere where there's some fat, People get very excited and think, oh, great, I'm having liposuction. It's not really like proper liposuction. It's small volumes. So it's not, don't think your tummy or your thighs are going to be recontoured. It doesn't do a huge um, amount of recontouring to the um, to the donor site. The place where you take the fat from isn't sort of uh, recontoured. It could be recontoured, but you'd probably do liposuction after the fat graft harvest. Because when you harvest fat for fat grafting, you do it under a very low pressure. When you do liposuction, you do it under really high pressure to suck all the fat out because your point of the surgery is to suck the fat out. When you do fat grafting, the point of the surgery is to get viable, healthy, alive fat cells. So you're much more careful, much more gentle with the fat when you're doing fat grafting. So it involves removing the fat from one area. You then process the fat. You don't necessarily inject it straight in. You process the fat by removing any dead fat cells or any fluid because you often put a bit of fluid in first before you re remove the fat. It's a standard for liposuction. Again, you usually use less fluid than you would for liposuction. Therefore, when you're harvesting for fat grafting, often the bruising is worse because the fluid helps stop um, bruising and bleeding. And if you put in too much fluid when you're doing fat grafting, when you're harvesting the fat, you just, just get loads and loads of fluid out. If you're doing liposuction, it doesn't matter if you've got loads of fluid in because you're, you're um, aspirating it under high volume, high pressure. Volume. So, uh, yeah, so you're often a lot more bruised for fat grafting than you would be for the standard liposuction. So it involves removing the fat, processing, getting rid of any of that uh, fluid, getting rid of any of those dead fat cells, and then just leaving yourself with the pure fat. And then you can inject the pure fat somewhere else. And you can inject it anywhere else. As I said, I think this patient is thinking of having the buttocks. That is not somewhere that we are encouraged to be doing now. It was a very popular procedure, and I think in other parts of the world it still is popular, but it has been linked with some fatalities, so we have been advised to not do it in the UK. Uh, at least the plastic surgeons have. And uh, But it can be injected in other places as well. The face, very common for the face, um, volume to the cheeks, anywhere there's sort of hollows um, around the eyelids, you can inject some fat to give a, uh, some, some volume. Uh, my area, which is the breast, is not mass. It, it, 
it is massively useful, but not massively useful in my experience in cosmetic breast. It's really useful in reconstructive breasts. When you're reconstructing one breast, if you do want to avoid an implant, which um, a lot of people do, particularly in breast reconstruction, because you're using radiotherapy, which can accelerate capsular contracture. So if you want to avoid an implant, using your own tissue, particularly if you're using tissue from your back, it's often not very big breast, about a B cup usually, um, depending on the size of the soft tissue coverage on your back. Uh, so you can augment that with fat grafting. And that was something I used to do an awful lot of, I used to do all the time when I was doing breast reconstruction. But now I'm doing cosmetic breasts mainly. I don't do it anywhere near as much because the problem with grafting is the results are subtle, the volumes are small. It's all very well if you're doing one breast, but if you have to split it across two breasts, it's often subtle. It's not normally a cut size in terms of breast augmentation. It's, so it is, it is a subtle result. But it is a very useful technique if there is some contour deformities, some deficiency somewhere you can. I'll tell you where it is good actually in breast, cosmetic breast, is if you've got rippling. It's very hard to get more cover over the implant if you've got rippling. You're very limited what you can do with rippling. You can possibly change the implant if they've got an older implant, which is a bit less filled. You could change it from on top of the muscle to underneath the muscle, if of course it is on top of the muscle. Um, but apart from that, there's not much you can do apart from putting on weight which is a pretty terrible thing to tell a person to do. So if you uh, don't want to put on weight or can't put on weight, then fat graft is sort of doing a similar sort of thing by giving it a bit of extra fat over the top of the implant. So in, in cosmetic surgery, I think it's got a really good role as a, as a permanent filler in the face. It's also got a role in uh, particularly one-sided asymmetries um, or contour irregularities of the breast but it's limited in its role for cosmetic breast augmentation. We can't really do it for buttock augmentation. Uh, it's also got a role in areas where people have got uh, some atrophy somewhere. So I've used it in someone who had a congenital deformity of her leg and it was smaller than the other leg. So I uh, used fat rather than using calf implants to, um, to, to build it up. But it all often needs several operations and the results are subtle. So it has to be in the right patient because it can be a bit of a long haul and you have to be aware of what can be achieved. You don't want to think it's going to be a panacea for everything, but it's a great, great thing, great technique for those indications. So that is what is this fat grafting? Since you asked, um, Olivia's laughing, I think. Uh, Sharon says, hi, JJ. Hi, Sharon. Olivia, can I ask a question that's not strictly plastic surgery related, but could be load, pre pressure, and dizziness causing falls? Say the patient is elderly and on high blood pressure tablets. If high blood pressure meds are stopped, will the dizziness subside and the falls stop? Blimey, Olivia. Blimey, that definitely is not plastic surgery related. Um, the answer to that is don't stop the blood pressure. Don't stop the blood pressure tablets. Speak to the doctor. The doctor should be able to deal with that. But, and, and, they, and I know the doctors are worried about coming out and things but you could perhaps help things over the phone um you're saying that there's low blood pressure so i'm assuming you've got a way of measuring the blood pressure so what you're talking about there is someone who's getting up and then having a low blood pressure that's uh, which i think is what you're saying is it because often that's called a postural drop in your blood pressure when you sit down and then you suddenly get up and the blood pressure drops and you fall because you're not getting enough blood to your brain uh, so that is a postural drop in your blood pressure so you've got to think, is the patient dehydrated? Is there a reason why they're having a postural drop in their blood pressure? That's the first thing I'd be thinking. Um, uh, are they bleeding? Um, so, okay, the doctor stopped them by phone yesterday. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you're on high blood pressure tablets and your blood pressure isn't high, so if you've got a way of measuring your blood pressure, then go for it. Talk to the doctor. Yeah, don't ask me, Olivia. I'm the last person you want to ask about blood pressure tablets and stuff like that it's not my um, not my but yeah that sounds um good that you've done it in conjunction with your doctor because that is uh you don't want to be messing with the tablets because you don't know what the, you know whether you can just stop them like that or not uh tummy tuck under epidural what sensations will i feel how long will it take to wear off will i need to be catheterized um I have not done a tummy tuck under epidural. Could you do a tummy tuck under epidural? I mean, epidural is usually the one, uh, you know, people who are pregnant having a um, uh, 
cesarean section. And what if you are having a so an epidural is what we call a regional anesthetic, which means a region of your body, so the lower half of your body is anesthetized. Um, usually, tummy tuck is done under a general anesthetic, which is completely asleep, or you can have it with a local anesthetic and sedation, which is just as I say, local anesthetic is just local to the to the tummy. So with a epidural, your legs don't work, whereas with a local anesthetic, it just affects the tummy; it doesn't affect the legs. Um, but you'd have to have sedation as well. So I, I, I don't know if you could have it under an epidural, um, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we would, if we were going to do it under a not a GA, we would be inclined to do it under a local anaesthetic with sedation. But it's, so we'd have to talk to Denise just about that. If there's a particular reason for having it under epidural. So what sensations will I feel? I think under epidural you don't really feel anything. You you might have a bit of sensation that something's going on, um, but you won't feel anything. Um, if you are having it under a, uh, a particularly if you're having something like liposuction, you will feel the movement of your body, you know, because obviously your upper half will feel movement. Um, if you're having a local anesthetic and sedation, so just to answer a different question, then you do feel bits and bobs, which is why you need to be on board with it. So we sometimes have to put a bit more anesthetic in because you might feel twinge here, twinge there, a bit of pushing, a bit of pull it, pulling. So, ooh, it's all dark. Um, so that's that's uh, but that's local anesthetic station. Um, will I need to be catheterized? A very, I would say that's quite surgeon uh, if you need to be catheterized. Uh, I don't routinely catheterize patients, there is morbidity associated with catheterizing patients in terms of the fact that you're putting a plastic tube in the bladder. Uh, usually, we would do it for comfort if the surgery is going to take a long time. Uh, we don't really want people waking up from surgery being desperate to go to the loo and they can't really move uh, to get to the loo. So uh, sometimes what we would do is put a, what we call an in and out catheter. So at the end of the surgery, put a catheter in to empty your bladder and then take it out straight away so that you can then carry on. But uh, if the surgery was taking a long time, there'd be a prolonged stay in hostel with being in bed. You might think about being catheterized just so you don't have to keep on getting on a bedpan and things just for to help with nursing, but standard for a tummy tuck, I wouldn't routinely catheterize personally for a tummy tuck. I don't know, maybe other people do. I don't know. Um, yes, we can't measure her blood pressure here. Okay, so you can't can't measure the blood pressure. So if you can't, so you don't really know that it's blood pressure. You're my favorite doctor. It's my old lady. Okay, good, good to know. <laughs> yeah, that is good to know. Tracy, hi JJ. Could you tell me why fat transfer to buttocks is dangerous? And what causes it to be fatal? Thanks. Yes, I could, Tracy. I could do that. Um, so, fat transfer to the buttocks is dangerous because there are very big blood vessels in the buttock area. There are uh, big veins, in particular, in the uh, in the in the area, and fat grafting to the buttocks. I've never done it. But it seems to be a bit more of a high bot. Oh, crikey. That's him again. Sorry. Sorry. Julia? Hey, Jack. Anyone? Hello? Can, can someone come and answer this call? It's the hot, it's that bad space. Where's mum? Sorry, sorry about that. Um, um, so there are very big blood vessels in the. Uh, oh, I wish I could cut that. Can I cut that bit? Uh, I don't think I noticed. Did they? Uh, I. Uh, there are very big blood vessels in the area, and what can happen if you inadvertently inject the fat into a blood vessel? The fat will then travel round the system as in what's called an embolus and then it can lodge and it lodges when the vessel gets small so what will happen is it will travel around the system it's usually in a vein go into the heart go through the heart then go into the pulmonary artery and lodge in one of the little um, capillaries in the lungs and, and form a blockage in your lungs and that's called a pulmonary embolus um, 
a PE. And uh, it's a fat embolus, that would be called. And that, if it's big, and if it, if it, if it's a big bit of fat and it gets one of the branch, sort of main branches of that artery and then it blocks the blood supply to the lungs, um, you can die. So you can die of a PE, basically. And that is where, why people are dying of fat embolus. It's a piece of fat goes into one of those big veins, travels around the body, lodges in your lungs and causes a fat embolus. Uh, so that is the, 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 the worry about it because fat transfer to the buttocks seems to be higher volume. Seems They seem to be putting quite a lot of fat in. That's the, one of the limitations in my hands of fat grafting. I use very small cannulas. I use quite small volumes. That's why I keep on saying it's subtle. But obviously the buttocks, you, they're putting big volumes in. I'm looking, thinking, how can they put such big volumes in? They're using big cannulas, they're using 50 mil syringes. I'm using a two mil syringe when I do fat tra transfer. They're using big syringes, injecting these big gobs of flat fat in. First of all, I'm thinking, how does that survive? And secondly, I'm thinking, well, that's the main one. I'm thinking, how does that survive, to be honest, if you put a big gob of fat in? Um, but the, 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 the reason it's fatal is that if you're putting big volumes in and it goes into a vessel, then it can kill you. Now, people who do it a lot say that there are ways you can do it safely and, you, you know, you can, uh, they're, they're doing studies to say, look, we need to train people that there are safe ways of doing it. So I don't want to make out as if it's sort of doom and gloom because the people who do it a lot say that actually you can do it safely and it is a good procedure and etc so it may come back but that is the reason that uh, people are dying or have died in the past um hope that's explained it sorry about the um problem in the, in the middle bit uh rebecca hey rebecca hey hey diddling i hope you're enjoying your lockdown with your with your floors it's so funny seeing you in chill clothes yeah chill clothes yeah my mum bought me this for christmas <laughs> i like it hmm? yeah there's a lot on that was um yeah no i i pretty I'm, I'm pretty street yeah i've got some street wear rebecca yeah i'm, I'm pretty out there gotta be honest i'm uh, down with the kids you know definitely how many hours does a standard tummy tuck take? Two and a half. Uh, two and a half to three. <laughs> a standard tummy tuck, a bigger tummy tuck might take longer. Liposuction might take longer if you, if you do it with liposuction. So three to four if you're doing liposuction or if it's a very big patient with a high BMI, it would take longer. But two and a half to three, I would say, is normal. No, we didn't see. You don't need to worry. Good. Yeah. Uh, if you get ch chance, can you discuss your tummy liposuction methods, please? There are different types, i.e. traditional vasor. Just wondering which type you use, or do you utilize different types depending on the patient? Thank you, Rebecca. I got the chance. Yeah, I got the chance. I'm, um, I'm here, and I've got the chance. So um, there are different types of liposuction. So it's interesting you say tummy liposuction there, because that's opened something up right there. So... Um, there are different types of liposuction. So liposuction is stick, sticking a tube in and, and sucking the fat out. So that's liposuction. So the sort of basic le level of liposuction is suction-assist liposuction, in FBL. So that means basically you stick a tube in, you suck it out, and that's just liposuction. So you can have what's called power-assisted liposuction, which basically is a machine which has got a tube, the, the metal liposuction tube or cannula as we call it and you stick the cannula in and the, the machine goes backwards and forwards so that you go backwards and forwards as well but it just it makes it easier you don't have to go backwards and forwards quite as much because the machine goes backwards and forwards so that's power assisted liposuction and that's what i use usually power assisted liposuction i don't know if it's a smaller volume i'm happy to use suction assisted liposuction as a fat grafting we use suction assisted you just do it with suction on a syringe but that's that's one and then you can assist in other ways so you can the other ways are delivering it delivering energy to the fat before you suck it and uh, the common ones are with laser energy or with ultrasound energy vasa is quite a um, um, a popular thing and people often ask for vasa quite uh, confusingly, VASA is ultrasound assisted energy. It's laser. You'd think VASA would be laser, wouldn't you? 
but anyway, it's not the cells showing. But anyway, so Baser is ultrasound. There are laser assisted liposuction like uh, Smart Lipo and uh, others. Anyway, there are laser ones. And what they do is they deliver energy to the fat before you suck it out. And it's a bit more tedious to do because you have to deliver the energy first and then you have to suck it out. There are going back in the day, there were worries that the energy could potentially cause damage to the skin and burn the skin. And you, you used to see some awful pictures of burns. I think they've got that sus now and I think they've got temperature probes and, and what have you so that they make sure they don't deliver too much energy to the skin so that you don't burn the skin. Um, and the good thing, the reason that the, the uh, VASA slash Smart Lipo and other sort of assisted forms are popular is because because you're delivering energy to the fat first, you can use a smaller cannula and it's a bit less traumatic. So therefore, it's often done under local insulation as opposed to power assisted, which would probably or usually needs a GA really. So it be more need to have it under, under local insulation, smaller cannulas. And also they say, no, I don't do it. So I don't want to be, you know, I, I don't, I can't uh, attest to this, but they say that the the vaser or the laser, the assisted forms, because they're delivering energy to the fat and it's sort of heating the fat up, it causes some degree of skin retraction. And so like you put there for t t tummy lipo. So you can use it on the tummy potentially because it might cause some degree of skin retraction. I don't know if it does or not, but because in my hands, I don't do just liposuction to the tummy. People often come and say, I just want a bit of lipo. I wouldn't do it because it doesn't cause skin retraction. If you don't get skin retraction and you have redundant skin on the tummy, you don't get a great result. So if someone comes to me and wants lipo to the tummy, I'm like, I don't think it'll be good unless it's the upper abdomen. The upper abdomen works pretty well, but if you've not had any, so usually if you've had a tummy tuck and you've got a bit in the upper abdomen, you can do some lipo there. But usually if you've not had anything done before, it's usually the lower abdomen where the excess fat is more than the upper abdomen and the skin doesn't recoil well and so you can get a bad result. so i wouldn't do it but i would say to you look you can think about these assisted forms like basil or something like that that might you know you have to speak to someone who does it and maybe you see if they've got some photos which say that they've had a good result um just thought of something um so but but i don't do it uh but that is the good thing about it. I'm not saying this. This is not. It's not like it's bad. But it's. Um, it's that's what it is. That's what it is. So those are different types. So yeah, Vaser is supposed to be uh, causing some degree of skin retraction. I think broadly speaking, results-wise, certainly looking at results, I'm not sure whether you can convincingly say that one type of liposuction is significantly better than another type of liposuction in getting results. I think it's very much operator dependent patient selection. So I think it would be hard to say that you can get a better result with one result, well, with one type of liposuction compared to another. But um, you might think one sounds better to you, so you might want to fancy that one. Hope that's helpful, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. Looks comfy. Thank you, Olivia. Would you sleep under local with sedation? Otherwise, that'd be a long time to be aware of surgery. Yeah, you do, Olivia. I think sometimes people think that um, that local and sedation, you're sort of awake, but you're not. You're sort of you're not awake. You are pretty pretty um, drowsy, should we say? And you may well sleep, and you certainly don't come out thinking, "God, that, that was boring." I was sat there for three hours. Um, I think what you got. Tummy tuck is quite a big deal to have under local anesthetic and sedation, Olivia. It can be done, but I think it's quite a big deal to have that under local sedation. So I think it'd be pushing it a bit, you know, as you say, two and a half hours, three hours. But you do tend to sleep. It's you, you're not. It's not like a pure local where you're totally awake and you'd be lying there thinking, flipping it, is this still going on? Um, yeah. Rebecca, thank you for asking my question. Rebecca, thank you for asking a question. Um, thank you for asking a question. Very grateful to you for asking a question because <laughs> you know me, I'm keen to have questions. Keen to have questions. Right. Um, I have tummy tuck by epidural, then breast uplift and implants a week later. How will my recovery be? 
absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. A tummy tuck by epidural. Then a breast uplift and implants a week later. Flip. I don't know what that uh, that is. Um, I don't know. I think that I can I can't imagine that. I think a tummy tuck by epidural a week later, you will be probably bent over. Forget the epidural thing. A tummy tuck, you will be bent over. You will be uncomfortable. Your wounds will not be healed. It will all feel quite raw. You will, you know, feel awkward taking deep breaths. You'll, you know, will be encouraging the to, you know, take deep breaths and to keep moving and all that. You and then to go into surgery and have a breast up with an, an implant. Forget it. Forget it. In my view, I don't know. This is something. It sounds like you got it all planned. But if you got it all planned, then fine. But um. Yeah, I think that sounds uh, like a bad idea. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself through that personally. I would um, not recommend it. So, um, the next question. I got a photo for, and I'm and I should have lined it up, shouldn't I? So I'm going to put this photo. I'm going to put. I'm going to. I'm going to leapfrog if if that's okay with everyone. Um, oh, hold on a minute. What's it's kicking off? It's kicking off. Thank you for asking. We've done that. Thank goodness for that. You'd be drowsy. Yes, Tracy. What type do you generally use? Um, power assisted liposuction, Tracy. I use power assisted liposuction with a machine called a micro air. Which is the thing that goes pause. I don't use the assisted forms in terms of laser or laser um, personally. I um, don't do it, don't feel the need for it. I think I can do everything I need to do with power assisted liposuction. I'm not uh, saying they're bad or good. And uh, like any time there's different ways of doing things, you'll find there's no best way. If one was a better way, we'd all do it that way. So, um, A discussion from an Indian surgeon. Discussion from an Indian surgeon. That sounds like a book. Um, right. I am now. So I'm going to. I'm looking for the photo. But while I'm looking for the photo, I'm going to multitask. I'm going to do this one here. If that's okay. But 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 all in fair warn. This this is the second to last question. Okay. So just just um just so you know. So let's get the. Um, so, good afternoon. I've just seen your incredible work. I also have a tattoo which I'd like to incise. Uh, could you give me an idea if it's possible to size a large tattoo? Large tattoo on my back, but I'd just like to incise part of it. From the beginning, I it by laser, but this treatment was unsuccessful. I had five sessions and left me with big scars. And then I made a second one, three times bigger than the first one to cover the old one. But in the place where the first tattoo was, there's a scar which is visible under the new tattoo. I'd like to make a decision of one part of the tattoo, maybe a few times, but I don't even know if it'd be possible. Um, so, oh, that's right. So, uh, this part, do you think it could be possible to excise this part and avoid destroying the rest of the tattoo? So, I've um, answered this patient, and the answer is um, no, because it's quite a large tattoo on on the back, and it's sort of on the shoulder and the back, and it, and it's too and it's too big really. So the first thing to say is it's too big, and so sometimes tattoos are too big. Um, this patient hasn't said that I can show the photo, which is great and fine. I totally understand, but just uh, FYI, if you have got a tattoo and you want to send me a photo, you do that. Send me a photo, and I'll give you an opinion on wh whether it can be removed, and if so, how much it'll cost and things like that. So uh, if you do want to do that, by all means, email me or or uh, this was an Instagram inquiry or a you know Facebook in message inquiry type thing. So um, by all means, do that. So no, this one was too big, full stop, because it was quite big on the back, you know, about that big on the back. But as a general terms, if you are going to remove a tattoo, you do distort the surrounding skin and you do distort the remaining tattoo. So if you're going to insert 
you're left with a scar with the remaining tattoo on either side. Or if you're going to do it like in this case, as patients uh, suggesting that we remove part of the tattoo but not the rest of the tattoo, it will distort the skin around the area and it will move the tattoo because you're removing that piece of skin and you're stretching the rest of the skin. So it will distort everything and it will look strange if you're just removing part of the tattoo because there'll be a big scar and then another bit of tattoo on either side of it. And because most of the time we're doing ellipses, which are the shape of the room tattoo, if it's adjacent, will change. So it, it will it will distort the tattoo that's left. So it's a bit it's a bit fraught with potential issues having um, part of the tattoo. So I think that is uh, something to very much consider if you are going to um, go down that route. Uh, I think what's more. So first of all, is it possible? And secondly, is it going to look better than what you've got now? Because often these tattoos and this one in particular look fine and often by excising them we can make them look worse because we give you there may be a reason you hate the tattoo maybe some kind of you know uh sort of uh linking with a, an event or a person or i don't know something emotional attached to it that you want to get rid of it which is fine but you have to be aware that it might make things not look great it might make as i say if you're leaving a tattoo nearby it might distort that and uh, obviously there'll be a scar. So it's all about that sort of being aware and being um, happy that it's actually worth doing. That's what it's all about when it comes down to. So where's that? I've got a photo of a... Oh, Rebecca's coming with it. Thank you. Oh, we've got, what, what's that? Oh God, what's happened here? Then the TT, then boobs a week later. The TT then booth Olivia, that's a that's crazy talk, Olivia. I wouldn't in my view, I mean, I don't know. If a surgeon's saying this to you, then maybe they've done it before and it's all worked out fine. But in my view, I'm like, have it done at the same time, no problem. Or three to six months later. That's it for me. I wouldn't a week later seems craziness in my view. I would have it done at the same time or three to six months later, and in fact, probably close to six months later. I'd have you, you know, if you can have the time and time, then wait six months and your boobs done. They're both big operations. Can fat return after tummy tuck or lipo? Interesting question, Tracy. A lot of people think it can. Uh, in fact, a lot of people think that so for some reason, liposuction, it can come back. I don't know why. I don't know why they've got this in their head that with liposuction, it can come back. But um, not strictly true, uh, Tracy. When you remove fat, you remove fat. For good we have all got the same amount of fat cells in our body fat people the fat cells are bigger than thin people so fat people don't have more fat cells they've just got bigger fat cells now when you do liposuction or when you do the tummy tuck or whatever you're removing fat you're removing fat cells and you're they're in a bucket somewhere they you know they've gone they can't come back they're gone those fat cells have gone from your body forever now having said that there will always be some fat cells left behind obviously so the fat cells that are left behind can get bigger so you can protect you from you know just because you spent thousands of pounds on liposuction or a tummy tuck if you put on weight you put on weight it doesn't give you a, a, a ticket to then go and you know, eat or, or, or eat unhealthily or not exercise or whatever, you can still put on weight if you've had a tummy tuck or liposuction and you can put on weight in the same area because you, there is some fat cells left behind in that area. So it is um, important to realize that that fat won't come back. That fat's gone forever. But the fat that you've got left behind can still, you can still get, get, uh, you know, put on weight. Um, so it is important to try and um, 
maintain your weight or at least have surgery when you're at a weight you can maintain. You don't want to, you don't have weight fluctuations after surgery because if you have weight fluctuations after surgery, your weight will fluctuate, you'll get bigger and smaller. Um, Uh, now, with regards to breast reduction procedure, typically what amount of volume reduction do you typically achieve? Can you can very large breasts ever be made very small? I'm guessing there is a limit how small someone with large breasts can go. Is an F to a C doable? So, um, good question, Rebecca. And you're absolutely spot on. There is a limit to how small you can go. Small... Um, rider on that in that you could go like if you did want to go really small you could do what's called a free nipple graft where you take the nipple off and put it back on again in which case you could go really small and that's for someone with huge breasts usually you wouldn't really be thinking about that for someone with an f cut breast it's all with an f cut breast you would be planning to keep the nipple attached on a stalk so that the blood supply and the nerve supply is attached to that nipple and that the bigger your breasts are more significant the lift is we call it the pedicle and that the, the more volume that holds so the bigger the breast will be afterwards the point one point two you want to have a nice shape to your breast a lot of people say i want to be really small get rid of them i've had enough of them Ugh, hate them want to be as small as possible and sometimes depending on the frame you don't want to have it too small. You don't want to lack projection. You want to have some projection. You want to have a nice shape to your breast. So those are the two things going through my mind. I want to keep the nipples, the blood supply, nerve supply alive with a, uh, enough tissue going to the nipple on the pedicle. But also I want to give a nice shape to the breast. I want to have it like a pyramid of the, nip, the nipple at the apex uh, of the breast to give a good shape. So that will define the size of the breast. I don't really go on cup sizes. So someone says, look, I'm an F. I'm not going to be happy unless I'm a C. I'll be like, hold on, hold on. I cannot guarantee that. I can guarantee they'll be smaller, and I can guarantee they'll be lifted, and I can guarantee they'll be significantly smaller, but I can't guarantee a cup size. Cup sizes were notoriously unreliable. It's very hard to predict cup sizes, and it's, um, it's something that so F to a C, C. D, W, D, E, F. That's four cup sizes. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that might be doable. But then, you know, C it might be a bit small on your frame. I don't know. Maybe D would be, I don't know. I mean, it's hard. To, F, it's quite a big jump, F to C. I, it's hard to say. But I think um, that in answer to your question, there is a limit. And what we would aim to do, we as in the plastic surgery fraternity, is to give you a nice shape, to give you a healthy nipple, and to try our best to give you the that you want but i think you'd have to go into surgery accepting that we couldn't guarantee the cup size but that my friend is a good question that's what i call a good question they've all been good but that has also been good that is a good question thank you for that rebecca um paul is in the house paul a long time no see can you get a good lift with a reduction? I've got very large bottom heavy breasts. Yes, you can, but you are always limited in terms of the shape that you can achieve with a lift slash reduction. So as I say, a reduction does incorporate a lift. And one thing that I'm always trying at pains to point out to people is the shape when you first, so it comes up here, Oh, there's a lift with implants. I just posted, I posted a picture on Instagram with a big lift with implants like that. So that's probably not relevant. So forget that. Anyway, um, when you first have done this up there, and then it settles, and it settles to a bit of a concavity in the upper pole. And I'm always at pains to get that out. So you have to be aware that it doesn't give you sustained fullness in the upper pole. When you're working on your own tissues, it always settles. Now, it gives you a significant lift to what you are now. A reduction always does give you a significant lift. But sometimes if people, again, it's, it's all, all about managing expectations. It's like I was saying about the tattoo question. You've got to manage people's expectations. You don't want to say, yeah, yeah, it's all going to be fine. And then it's not fine. And then they're unhappy. And then, the, you know, you've got to say, look, this is realistic what you can achieve. And you can, once it settles, there will be a concavity in the upper pole. Now, I would say that's not, and I would say that, 
but some people will say hold on a minute it's droopy i want it to be more you know up there i'm like a natural breast is droopy or, or you know it does have a, a a sort of a fall in the upper pole from the from the upper chest to the nipple it's sort of a concavity that's a natural shape so you have to be aware that it does settle but still it does give a significant lift so it's really a question of looking at some before and after photos seeing what sort of results can be achieved and saying hold on a minute um i don't i'm not happy with that or yeah that's much better i'm happy with that and because you're um i'm very happy no charge for consultation not that i can do consultations at the moment well i do vi virtual I'm doing virtual on the phone uh, this is virtual isn't it we're doing a virtual consultation now but um yeah so very good that's another good one paula rebecca did a good one you did a good one we're on a roll here but yeah it's uh it, it will significantly improve the shape and also obviously the size and the symptoms you get from very large heavy breasts uh but you have to be from you have to be ready for the once it settles for the, for the shape uh, which as i say is, is usually quite a nice natural shape uh tracy thank you thank you tracy uh rebecca thank you very tall getting a bit of feedback here thank you too look at that three thank yous in a row freaking heck blimey um uh, right i've delayed long enough i uh, still haven't found my photo i'm trying to find my photo halfway anyway scar revision to piercing hole um right so this what's the full question oh that's it that is the full question okay i'm gonna wait okay so this question is a patient who has a piercing hole and wants to get rid of it and they've allowed me to show their photo so I, but i find their photo um so uh, my cousin has got a piercing hole in her nose and she asked me to uh, if i could do anything about it and i said that i couldn't um it's actually my cousin's daughter but but i couldn't and it's very hard to get rid of these piercing holes because anything we do causes a scar and um, the scar can look similar to the piercing hole that is the problem and so you again you have to be aware of what can be achieved now one of the so there will always be a mark there but it might be that the mark is better the pill, particularly if it's the dent you don't like if it's the hole you don't like if you wear makeup and the makeup goes in a hole and you don't like that then um maybe you know there's a there's an argument to say it would be a good thing to do um but you have to be aware that it will leave a um a mark now, now when someone has these sorts of things they often have um well, where's the, where's the email with my photos on it they often have as i say a bit of a dent and you might think well i would quite like to um get rid of that dent and so it is always difficult to get rid of dented scars and you might think well what about putting some filler underneath the scar to push it up um i had someone patient a patient talk to me about that um liam wanted wanted uh filler to 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 to, to lift it up but in my experience of putting filler into a dented scar the what happens is that the scar is unforgiving and the um filler goes on either side of the scar so that it actually accentuates a defect so it, if the filler goes on either side and the um the dent looks actually worse when you try and inject filler um into the scar so in my experience i think uh it is better to oh, 
can't find a focus now. It is better not to try and put. Do I sit? Do I appear distracted? Sorry if I do. I'm trying to show these photos, but you know what? After all this, I'm not going to be even uh, not to put filler in. If you again, if you can find someone who can um, who can get good results with that, then fine. But I but I find that it can potentially accentuate the defects. I think, as I recall, this is like a this is like a, de a dented in scar. I can't remember where it is. But, um, oh, it's a piercing hole. Oh, it's not a dented in scar. Okay, so the other thing you do, so a piercing hole is difficult. And if you were excising it, you're going to make the scar slightly longer. So you're going to make a slightly longer scar. Now, the aim is to make a flat scar, where, as I say, the hole, it might be an issue that there's a hole. So the hole could be made better, but uh, there would still be a scar there. The other thing is if you have, like, a dented in scar, and it, it would be possible to... The ways to fix that are first you can excise it and close it, but again, it would still leave you the scar. And because you're excising the scar, it's slightly longer than the original scar. And uh, the other alternative is you can um, try and so a dented in scar, like classically sort of like an acne scar, is like a, a dent. And you can try and left that dent by taking off the top layer of the skin by some method. There's different ways of doing it. You can do it with acid, which would be called a peel, or you can do it with laser, which would sort of burn the skin. But some kind of resurfacing, dermabrasion, which is basically like sandpaper, um, to take the top layer of the skin off to try and make these dents look a bit less dented in. So that might help with something like an acne scar, which is like a deep dented in scar, not so much with a piercing, because a piercing would all all the way through um, last last ditch effort to try and find these photos oh, not there. no can't find them oh, sorry Actually, it's not a piercing. Why have they put piercing? It's a chicken pox scar. Yes, I remember this. I found it. Found it. Found it. I found it. I found it. Right. Yes. This is going to be worth it, guys. So, um, yes, this is not a piercing. This is a... Uh, this is like a dented in scar. So actually, I thought this one might be um, potential to, to improve with surgery. So, um, yeah, I'll So what we're going to do now, people, is we're going to use a bit of technology, a little bit of technology, to um, demonstrate this. Check me out. Can you see that? No, okay. This is what we call slick, okay? This is how it's done. Anyone out there think you're doing this, this is how you do it, team. You just seamlessly bring the photo in. Okay. Very slick. No one even knows what's going on. No one knows. Hmm? Show in stream. That's what I needed. Show in stream. Why is it in the stream? That is in the stream. Look at that. That's what I'm talking about. You see that, people? You see that? So there. I think you'll agree that was worth waiting for. So that is what's this. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you can see there's a dented, a dented scar here. So you might think filler will be a good thing. I don't think personally. I don't think filler will be a good thing. 
I think maybe some kind of resurfacing might help in terms of uh, laser or, or um, chemical peel, uh, which is basically like an acid, something like that, to try and take off the shoulders of it. Or could consider scar revision. Scar revision would involve cutting it out, which probably I think would probably be my option. But I, I, full disclosure, I don't do laser or chemical peels, so maybe better, I shouldn't say that. She's going to speak to someone who does laser and chemical peels or some kind of resurfacing to see whether that'd be a good option. But um, cutting it out would leave a, still leave a scar, be a line, but the aim would be trying to make it not so much of a dent. It's the dent that's the problem because you fill it with makeup and like that. So thank you very much for letting me show you photo. Sorry it took me so long to find the photo. But anyway, um, yeah. I love it. I love being able to show photos. That really gives another dimension, doesn't it? There's another dimension to this. Uh, I think we'll agree with that. Um, yeah, so that's where I am with scar revision to um, piercing hole. So in case you didn't see it properly, we'll just do that. Or we can do that. Or in fact that. That's what you want, isn't it? Yeah, that's what you want. Well, there we go. So, um, look at that. That's how we do it. Kelly is clapping. I think she's clapping the uh, techni technology um, that was going on there. Right, what's going on? Uh, Natalie's got something to say. Hope you're well. With regards to surgery to make breast symmetrical again, I need a lift and implants. How close to them being more or less the same can actually be achieved. I've been advised to have two different size implants, but I've been told that there could still be some asymmetry thereafter. It's hard to find pictures of this to see actual results. Thank you. Um, yes, so you've got options here, Natalie, if you're having a lift in implants. If you're just having, if you're just having implants, obviously you need different sized implants. Now, I've got to be honest with you, Natalie. I tell everybody, like 100% of the people, that they um, will have an asymmetry afterwards. And everybody is asymmetr asymmetrical before. So if you're just doing implants, then yes, you can have what's called a differential augmentation where you use different size implants. Now, I think you're absolutely right to be advised that there, you'll say there could be still some asymmetry thereafter. I would probably say to you there will still be some asymmetry afterwards. The aim is to try and make it better. No one is perfectly symmetrical. What because the implants come like 200, 250, 300, whatever, you know, they come as fixed volume. Let's just say we put an implant in the smaller breast. So we put a 250 cc implant in the smaller breast. Then we put a sizer in the other breast. And we let's just say we had an empty bag and we filled it up and it was 223 cc's was perfect but well, we haven't got a 223 cc implant we've got a 200 or another 250 so we've got to go too big or too small this is the challenges we have so we just have to get it about right so you know often slash always you can't make it perfect and we're just trying to bring the symmetry in now one thing i would say that if you make them bigger the even if the asymmetry is the same. So I, I've got photos I show people of people who've got asymmetrical breasts where I've used the same size implants and the actual, the asymmetry looks less. It's absolute asymmetry is the same, but proportionally it's less. So if you've got two breasts, one's 50 cc's, one's 100 cc's, and you put a 400 cc implant in both, now before you've done surgery, one's twice as big as the other, one's 100, one's, one's 50. But when you've done surgery, one's four, one's 500 so there's only 50 cc's only 10 10 percent difference and there was a hundred percent difference before so proportionally or whilst it's still 50 cc's proportionally it's less so sometimes it actually looks better even if you use the same size implants but even if we use different size implants it's hard to get it perfect there is a little bit more flexibility if you're having a lift with implants because if you're having a lift with implants there's a possibility of doing a small reduction of the bigger breast to help balance it out. And you could perhaps have same size implants and a reduction of the bigger breast, or as has been suggested, different size implants. But you've got a bit of a, a bit more leeway with a lift because you can take some volume out when you do the lift. But still, 
it's really hard to make them perfect and no one is perfect uh, Natalie so the aim is to make it better and it's just a question of looking at some photos looking at some results of your surgeon and seeing what you know what's reasonable but I don't think it's unreasonable that what they're saying to you that uh, if you have different size implants there could be some asymmetries afterwards I think that's uh, that's not unreasonable um, Kelly wanted information on tummy tuck had to have an emergency hysterectomy in 2013 I'm left with lots of skin it's really embarrassing um, Kelly I've got a guide of frequently asked questions you can download it from our website I've also got information on my website um, actually Natalie are you saying you can't find pictures of actual results have I got pictures God, that's a good point. I don't know. I've got a page on breast asymmetry. Have I not got pictures of breast asymmetry? So I'm sure I must have on my website. Anyway, I'm surprised you can't find it. Um, uh, but Kelly, yeah, there's information on the website. There's a guide. You can download the guide. Go to the website, stianoplasticsurgery.co.uk, um, or just message me. I'll send you a guide. Um, and yeah, I mean, often there's a combination of having too much skin, obviously, from the child. And also the hysterectomy, if that's, if that's, um, oh, sorry, hysterectomy, maybe not, didn't have a child, but if you have had children, you've got too much skin. Uh, but the hysterectomy scar can be tethered, um, and that can make the overhang look worse. So it can be a combination of the two. Uh, if you've got too much skin and the tethered scar, it can accentuate the, the uh, excess skin. But uh, yeah, a tummy tuck would get rid of that scar, so that would be an option. Um, what information can I give you? Any information in particular? But yeah, I've got a guide with the frequently asked questions. That'd be, if you've got any specifics, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you, Olivia. No, I can't see. No, I can't see the scar. Can you zoom in? It's above the nose between the eyebrows. Yeah, I can't zoom in, Olivia. God, God, took me ages to get the picture. Yeah, it was here. It was there somewhere. Um, God, am I a bit, I'm a bit behind on these messages. How old is too old for breast implants? Is it true that they'd have to be changed or removed after a few years? Kim, this day and age, do you know, it's, it's fitness for surgery, really. So there isn't an age limit on it. Um, although you would think maybe, you know, people very old wouldn't be that interested, but there's no surgical age limit on it anyway. As long as you're medically fit and if you're not medically fit then even if you're young it might be you know, an idea not to have it so the age is not a problem um they, they it is true that they may have to be changed or removed uh usually more than a few years uh, five or ten years they can start to go hard and there are different types of implants you can use which are less likely to go hard but around five or ten years they can start to go hard now you don't have to have them removed a lot of people say they've got to be removed every ten years not true they don't have to be removed every 10 years but they might start to go hard you might want to have them removed and uh, that can be a bigger operate well it is a bigger operation than the first operation so it's something to think about and it's something to factor in it's more expensive than the first operation as well so you have to factor that in but yeah that is a, that is a possibility that you might need an operation five or ten years down the line you don't have to have one though a lot of people have got 15 20 years with implants and they're fine so it's not a definite but they may well need to have um the move super technology you're absolutely right olivia you've seen it here first cutting edge split screen we've got the lot here um kelly i had a child at the same time yes so the child does it yeah the um the child will stretch the skin and uh, so that uh, basically i'll be saying to you is your is your weight stable if you smoke if you, if you smoke i would say probably don't have a tummy tuck really it's that bad so if you don't smoke your weight's stable and your weight's pretty good then then yeah but uh can definitely talk i'll tell you what kelly you can have a consultation you can book a virtual consultation with me online if you want uh on facebook um over there or over there over one of those sides is a booking it should be booking tab i'm looking at me yeah it's that one there over there there should be a booking thing you could Anyway, um, Natalie's with me. I'm with me. They're going to be bigger. One is going to be 320 and the other is going to be 390. So hopefully they'll look more similar. I'll double check your website and see what I can find. Yeah, if not, I'll have to I'll double check it myself as well, Natalie. That's something I can do. Put some breast, uh, breast asymmetry photos on. Kelly, thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you for participating. Vilma is very late. Vilma, you have no excuse whatsoever. Actually, you probably have. You've probably been doing dinner, haven't you? So that is, that is a valid. Yeah, yeah actually, you've been doing dinner. Valid. Don't worry, Vilma, you haven't missed anything. Um, a bit of a shambles today, Vilma, if I'm honest. Um, Kim, thank you. Uh, Olivia's taken my advice on board, sat pondering, think tummy tuck under local, etc. is a no-go, especially with boobs a week later. I'll rethink. I would rethink if I was you, Olivia, but um, a week later is craziness. Talk to people who've had a tummy tuck and say, would you have had a breast lift with implants a week later? Flipping heck. No, no. In my view. I mean, I don't know. What do I, I don't know everything. There might be people out there who've done it and said, yeah, it was great. I don't know. Kelly, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Natalie. Thank you. Good luck with Natalie. Uh, that's exciting. I hope you get your surgery soon, Natalie. I hope we're allowed back in the operating room for soon. When are we going to be allowed back in the operating room? When are we going to be allowed back in? Goodness knows. I, I could, it can't come soon enough as far as I'm concerned, but we have got to this thing under control. I totally understand that. Um, but as I say, it might be in the operating room sooner rather than later in terms of the reconstructive work, which will be um, good, good to be of some help. So, um, right, I'm at, an, I'm at an end. I'm at my wit's end. I'm sorry about, about the technical difficulties with the phone ringing and the um, getting the photo up. But you know what? That's live TV. And that's uh, any influence will, t will tell you that you know when you are a social media influencer you've got to take it rough with the smooth and these things happen fyi this very recording is going to go on the podcast so if you're into podcasts please do listen to my podcast well if you've just listened to it just now on the facebook live don't worry so this is on facebook live at seven o'clock on tuesday if you're listening to it on the podcast but if you're listening to it on facebook live you can listen to it on the podcast or previous ones that was a good bit of marketing there by me, if you don't mind me saying. Um, Olivia, I was panicking off the live last week, thinking about waiting a long time to have the surgery in the UK, so looking at options in India. Oh, wow. Okay. But hold on a minute, Olivia. In, are India doing surgery? They're in lockdown as well, aren't they? Are they? Are India? There's India. They, can they do surgery in India? Perhaps I... I should go over there and do some surgery. Me too. Wondering how much a nose job would co cause just to weigh up my cost. I think. I'm thinking about breaking my boyfriend's nose. I'm just joking to stay safe. Hi me. <laughs> Is it that bad? God. Velma, do you recommend breast augmentation, tummy tuck, and liposuction all in one procedure? Otherwise, mummy makeover. Um, I wouldn't say I recommend it, Velma, but I, I'd say it's a totally reasonable combination, uh, and it's particular, you know, and and. A breast procedure and a tummy procedure is reasonable. The breast augmentation is not that, you know, is, is not that big an operation in terms of what you can do to the breast. So, you know, breast reduction would be a bigger operation. The breast lift with implants would be a bigger operation. So it'd be perfectly reasonable to combine that with a tummy tuck uh, and liposuction. It'd be perfectly reasonable. And it's a discussion on a one-to-one -one basis with people to see what they want. Some people want it all in one operation to get it all over with, to have one recovery. Uh, and they prefer that. Other people think, flip neck, I, you know, I'm just going to get one of them. You know, it's mainly my breast or my tummy that's the problem. So I want to get that one fixed first. And then, you know, sometime after, as I say, probably around six months later, you, you may want to do the, do the other one or a year later or whatever. But it's very, is it very common? Or is, you know, it's pretty common to do them both together. Is it in the name, mummy makeover? So yeah, I'm not saying I would necessarily recommend it, Vilma. But I would definitely do it if that's what people wanted, because it suits some people, but it doesn't suit other people. But it's definitely a thing that can be done. And, and I can understand why it can suit people to get it all in one go. Cost, yeah. Not cause. No, but I think they will start up surgery quicker than UK after lockdown. OK, well, maybe, uh, Olivia. Yeah, well, you might be right, Olivia. Oh, God, here we go. Everyone's going to go to India now. It's bad enough that we stopped operating. Now everyone's going to go to India and have their operation. Oh, my God. Any patients to operate on? Oh God, what a nightmare! Anyway, on a lighter note, I'm sure we'll be out of this 
before we know it and we'll look back and think yeah it was a little bit of a blip but um yeah i hope i hope we'll get out of it soon ish so thank you all for participating very very grateful to you sorry that there was some shambolic slash slapdash areas throughout the recording i do uh, that and i will uh, reflect on it and try and uh, present a more professional look next time thank you olivia thank you so i'm going to check out if that's okay and i wish you all a good night hold on a minute not my legs they are your surgery all right all right okay thank you olivia excellent kelly i've got itb I... provitus no not provitus uh would there be a problem um itp kelly is that what is that is that uh, is that something to do with it is that a blood thing thank you i'll probably book appointment after this lockdown is finished please do wilma um if it is if i if it is uh kelly i would talk to your hematologist um you so you can talk to your hematologist or if you came then uh if it is a hematology thing um then i would um we would liaise or we would liaise it with a doctor um yeah okay hematologist uh who is looking after that to see whether we need to maximize whether you want steroids you want steroids i didn't treat that with steroids um so we would liaise with your doctor looking after that to say look first of all is it safe for her to have surgery because they must say look at that, no way don't do surgery very high risk okay well we won't do it if it is safe for you to have surgery then we say look can we optimize you are you optimized at the moment or are you in a position where you you know treatments being adjusted and things like that they're trying to get your treatment levels right because if you're not optimized, we, they might say, look, wait, give it six months because we're trying to get her treatment right or whatever. So we talk to your doctor to see whether, first of all, whether they're happy and think it's safe for us to give the procedure. And secondly, whether there's something they can do to optimize it. And then we talk to the anesthetist and, and get things um, worked out that way. So that's how we would work. Tracy, I wouldn't even think about having surgery in India. I'm going to wait for you to do it. Thank you, Tracy. Right, someone's waiting. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> Don't all go to India. No, do what you've got to do, guys. If you want to go to India, that's fine. Do what you've got to do. You've got to do the right thing for you. Um, don't worry about me. God. Anyway, dear, oh dear. Right. Good night, Olivia. Stay safe. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. I will do my best. And yeah, that was a good one. That was a good one. So I'm going to check out now and I will see you all next week, seven o'clock. Um, Kelly, thanks for your participation. And please participate next week and ask me any questions. Now, the tummy tuck guide on the website, what have you. Um, if you've got any questions, actually, you don't even have to come back next week. Just message me on Facebook or whatever. If you've got any questions, very happy to ask them if I can. And uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. And I will see you same time, same place. And I hope you all, yes, yeah, stay safe in your lockdown. Wash your hands. And um, I'm going to go wash my hands. Do my hands get really dry? It's getting really dry. I've got moisturizer as well, but I don't want to moisturize as soon as I wash them. So I have to have a. Anyway. <sighs> getting delirious there so i will see you all next week basically but if you have any questions please message me keep them coming uh keep your chin up we're going to get through this and i'll see you on the other side or next week whichever one comes first probably going to be next week isn't it so see you next week for the same again and vilma good night to you too sleep well nighty night